Hi everyone, in this video I want to talk about what exactly a polymer is. Polymers have been around forever. However, they were not really understood until a little less than 100 years ago. Polymers are incredibly important to just about everything in your life. From a lot of the materials in your clothing, the Tupperware in your cupboard, many components of a plane or your car, etc. In this playlist we are going to be going through the extremely interesting area of study, polymer engineering, wherein we develop and explore properties and characteristics of different polymers. So, now that we know why studying polymers and engineering their properties are important, let's talk about how we identify polymers and what exactly they are. I'm just going to write down a couple examples of many polymers that you may recognize. The first one is commonly used as plastic bags you may see in the superstore. The second is commonly used for plastic pop bottles. And the last one is used for PVC piping. Do you notice any similarities between these three polymers? You may notice that in each polymer there is a pattern. There is one piece in each of these polymers that is continually repeated and chained together to grow extremely large. These one unit building blocks, the portion of the polymer that is repeated, is called a monomer. Mono meaning one or a single unit, and a mer, which means repeating unit. So monomers are molecules that are structural units in polymers. Similarly, poly means many, and again mer means repeating unit, and that's all a polymer is. It is just many repeating monomers connected together. Therefore, polymers are just very large molecules composed of these repeating units. And these can grow relatively gigantic, such as millions of repeating units connected together, which is pretty incredible. You may also hear the term oligomer, which is just another way to say a short chain synthesized of only a couple monomers. But just to be clear, oligomers are polymers. However, it is typically just easier to refer to lower molecular weight or shorter polymers as oligomers and higher molecular weight or longer chains as polymers. Hi everyone, in this video we are going to be talking about what the degree of polymerization of a polymer means and how we go about calculating it. Let's begin with the definition of degree of polymerization. The degree of polymerization is the number of repeating units in a given polymer, so the number of monomers connected together in the polymer. Let's say that you are going to be buying some low density polyethylene to make plastic bags for your company. The chain length of all the different polymers in the liquid you bought are going to be an average around some mean polymer chain length. The molecular weight of the mean chain length, or the most frequent chain length, is called the number average molecular weight. There is also a weight average molecular weight, which is not applicable to the degree of polymerization. It is the average weight of all your low density polyethylene. These two measures of molecular weight are different, as a higher number of longer polymers will have a higher molecular weight, bringing the weight average molecular weight higher. This graph here should make it more clear what I'm saying to you. Obviously, if you're buying a product from a company, the graph that I'm presenting here would obviously look much tighter around the molecular weight that you need. So, it could say within a given range, 99% of the polymers will fall in that desired weight region. Alright, so now that we have covered some of the general concepts, how do we go about calculating the degree of polymerization? To determine the degree of polymerization, it is the number average molecular weight over the molecular weight of the repeating unit, which should make sense, right? We are trying to determine the amount of monomer units that our large polymer consists of. So, if we were to weigh the polymer and divide that by the monomer molecular weight, we would find the degree of polymerization, or how many monomers are stuck together within our polymer. In the next video, we will perform a couple practice questions. So, if you're still at all confused about a polymer's degree of polymerization, I recommend you check out that video. Hi everyone, in this video I want to talk about one of the ways in which we can classify polymers. That is, we can classify polymers as homopolymers or copolymers. Let's begin with a homopolymer. A homopolymer is a polymer that is constructed of a single monomer, which should make sense when examining the name, right? We can interpret homo to mean the same. So it is a polymer made up of only the same monomer. So if we have these orange balls representing monomer A and these green squares representing polymer B, then we can have two different homopolymers, one constructed only of polymer A and another constructed of only polymer B. Now that we have an understanding of what a homopolymer is, what do you think a copolymer could be? Well, a copolymer is a polymer that is constructed of more than one monomer. Now, copolymers are certainly more diverse than homopolymers, as we can have tons of different configurations. Let's go through some now so that you have an idea of how diverse copolymers can actually get. 
So let's write down our legend again. Firstly, we could have an alternating copolymer. This is when monomers A and B alternate when creating a polymer structure. Secondly, we could have block copolymers, which are similar to alternating copolymers, except that there are groups of either monomer connected together, but they are broken up in an alternating fashion by groups of the other monomer. Thirdly, we could have what is called a graft polymer, which is essentially a homopolymer base with branches of another monomer-based homopolymer grafted on. We can take grafted to be another way of saying attached or connected. Lastly, we could have no real structure at all between the two connecting monomers. This is simply called a random copolymer. There is no distinct pattern in the way in which the monomers are connected together. Hi everyone. In this video, I want to talk about another way in which we can classify polymers. We will be talking about the ways in which we can classify polymers according to their chain structure. However, before we begin, just note that we have previously discussed the differences between homopolymers and copolymers. So if you missed that video, I'd recommend checking that video out first, and there will be a link in the description of this video so you can do that. To define a polymer by its chain structure means to define the polymer based on the way the monomers are connected to one another within the polymer. So let's begin with the most simple, and then we will work our way to more complicated chain structures. Firstly, we could have a linear polymer chain structure. In a linear polymer, there are no branches off the main polymer. So a linear polymer will generally look like this, and it makes sense as it is just a straight line of monomers. This category of chain structures is almost exclusively thermoplastics, as the linear chains can simply slide around one another when heated and reconfigure their structure to whatever mold or dye they are placed in. Secondly, we could have a branched polymer chain structure. This means that the main linear polymer chain now has some branches of monomers off of it. Think of this being like a tree branch, for example. Many branched polymer chain structures also fall into the thermoplastics category. However, if there are enough branches to prevent the fluidity of the polymers, the branch structure would likely be a thermoset at that point. Thirdly, we could have a star branched polymer chain. These are similar to branch polymer chains, however, all of the branches come off of one central monomer. And as you can see here, it is obvious where the name comes from, as it does indeed look like a star. This type of polymer chain can either be a thermoplastic or a thermoset, depending on how long the branch chains are and if there is any cross linking occurring. Fourthly, we could have polymer networks. Polymer networks are composed of many small polymer chains that are connected either covalently or non-covalently, and it creates this noodle-like structure or cross-linked pattern. These are almost exclusively thermosets, as the polymers have no mobility within the structure and can't become liquid enough to reconfigure themselves to be recycled and reshaped at higher temperatures. Lastly, we could have interpenetrating networks. These types of polymer chain structures consist of multiple polymer networks further intertwined within one another. So you can think of this like talking about our two polymer networks that I've drawn here, and then they are intertwined and woven together almost, and these again will almost always be thermosets, due to how they are configured and the lack of mobility in the polymers. Now these are certainly not the only ways that we can classify polymers by chain structures. However, these four categories cover just about everything. There are many subcategories of these types of polymers, such as palm tree polymers and cone polymers are just different types of branch polymers. Hi everyone, in this video I want to talk about yet another way in which we can classify polymers. We will be talking about the ways in which we can classify polymers according to their origin. By origin here, I mean how the polymer was created. So let's get right into it. When talking about the origins of polymers, there are two main categories. Natural and synthetic polymers. Let's first look at natural polymers, as that is where polymers all began, so it seems fitting that we should start here. Natural polymers are polymers that are naturally occurring in nature, so there is no human interaction needed for their development. Some common natural polymers that you may know of is DNA, cellulose, proteins, polysaccharides like the starch in potatoes, rubber from a rubber tree, not vulcanized rubber like in a tire wool, and silk, just to name a few. These natural polymers are produced by biological processes and are often easily biodegradable. 
this is really cool, as often these natural polymers can be used for making plastics that are biodegradable. However, in general, there are limitations to these, as they are often not as durable or strong as many synthetic polymers, and we cannot customize the polymer to have the properties that we want as easily. Now, let's move on to what synthetic polymers are. Synthetic polymers are man-made polymers. Synthetic polymers are widely used as they are often cheap to produce and we can implement various additives to achieve the properties that we want. However, synthetic polymers are often derived from petroleum and due to their inability to degrade, pose an environmental threat on both fronts. That is to create the polymer and to discard the polymer. Some common synthetic polymers that you may be familiar with are plastic bags, plastic containers, some thermoset plastics used in the automobile industry, and tons of other amazing applications. Lastly, we do have a field somewhere in the middle. This type of polymer is considered semi-synthetic polymers, which are chemically modified versions of natural polymers. So, in this class of polymers, we take a natural polymer and apply something to it to make it better for a certain application. An example of this type of polymer is vulcanized rubber, like the tires in your car, or rayon, which is a modified cellulose-based polymer, which is a commonly used textile material. Hi everyone, in this video, I wanna go through a quick review of what the molecular weight of a given molecular species is, and more specifically, we'll be talking about how to determine the molecular weight of a polymer and what exactly that means. So remembering back to some of our earliest chemistry classes, we are taught about the molecular weight of various atoms, which, if you remember, is typically given on the periodic table as grams per mole, which just means when you have an Avogadro's number of those atoms, we have so much weight. So we can write that as the definition for the molecular weight of a given species is the sum of the atomic weights of all of the atoms within the polymer per mole. Since we are often dealing with very large molecules, do you think we would have a very large molecular weight or a low one? Well, since the molecular weight measures all of the atoms in one Avogadro's number of a polymer, it makes sense that our molecular weight will be huge compared to one mole of carbon atoms, for example. For a more practical example, think of HDPE, commonly used in a lot of food packaging applications, which has a molecular weight of 1,000 to a million, depending on the average polymer chain length of the polyethylene. And therefore, it can weigh anywhere from one to 100 kilograms per mole, whereas the molecular weight of water is about 18 grams per mole, which is practically nothing. So the longer the polymer chain is, and the heavier the atoms are within the polymer chain, the larger the molecular weight of the polymer will be. This molecular weight has a large impact on many properties of the polymer, such as its tensile strength, toughness, elongation to break, which is how stretchy the polymer is, melting temperature, stress crack resistance, and many other things. So understanding the molecular weight of the polymer you may someday be working on is very important. So a higher molecular weight polymer will be better at absorbing impacts when it's a solid and much more viscous as a liquid, whereas a lower molecular weight polymer will tend to be more stretchy and flexible in general, but much weaker. However, since polymers are not going to have the exact same chain length, we have to work with averages for polymer samples. Therefore, we need to consider a bit of statistics to more appropriately define our polymer. So imagine you have this beaker full of a polymer and you want to identify the molecular weight of the unknown species. So we classify the molecular weight of polymers as either a number average molecular weight or a weight average molecular weight. The number average molecular weight of a polymer is the average molecular mass. So think of this as the chain length that appears most frequently in your sample. This is calculated as the total weight of the polymer samples divided by the number of polymers in your sample whereas the weight average molecular weight is the average polymer weight. So if you have a large number of long chains or a large number of small chains, this average will be brought larger or smaller respectively. This graph should make both concepts more clear to you. Hi everyone. In this video, I wanna talk about what the polydispersity of a polymer is. So the polydispersity of a polymer is a nice way of characterizing the molecular weight distribution of a polymer. The formula for the polydispersity of a polymer is the weight average molecular weight over the number average molecular weight. 
If you missed our past few videos on both the number average molecular weight and the weight average molecular weight, I will put the links of these in the description below in case you are curious. Just note that the polydispersity of a polymer is also sometimes referred to as the polydispersity index, or the PDI for short. So what does this really mean? Well, a high polydispersity index means that we will have a very diverse polymer sample. By that I mean that our average polymer chain length is highly varying. Whereas if we have a low polydispersity index, the molar mass of the polymer sample are going to be highly concentrated. So in summary, with a high polydispersity, your sample is very dispersed, meaning that it is very spread out. Inversely, with a low polydispersity, your polymer sample is going to be very not dispersed, meaning that almost all of your polymer lengths are going to be concentrated around one polymer molecular weight, which is the same thing as saying that our polymers will be almost all the same length. I should also mention that there is a rare case in which the weight average molecular weight and the number average molecular weight are equal, and this is called monodispersed polymers. This means that all of our polymers are the exact same length. Hi everyone, in this video, we're going to go through an example wherein we find the number average and weight average molecular weight for the following data set. So let's get right into the problem. As you can see here, we are given a data set for a certain polymer sample, and it gives us the number of polypropylene polymers for a given molecular weight. You could also be given a range of molecular weights here, and in that case, you would likely just need to make an assumption like assume that the middle weight of that range accurately represents the whole range of weights. However, in reality, if you are performing an experiment where you're trying to find the molecular weight of a polymer sample, you can always use smaller molecular weight ranges to minimize potential error from our initial mean molecular weight assumption. So let's begin by solving for the number average molecular weight of this polypropylene sample. The number average molecular weight formula is presented here. It is saying that the statistical mean, or average polymer molecular weight, is equal to the sum of the number fraction of each range times the molecular weight of each range. So, this will tell us where the majority of our polymer sizes are. So, let's determine the total number of polymers we have. This is simply done by summing all of the polymers in this column here. Now, we can show the number fraction of each polymer range by dividing the number of polymers for each molecular weight by the total number of polymers in our sample. And that is all we need to do to find the number average molecular weight. We just apply the formula we discussed previously and multiply the number fraction for each molecular weight by the molecular weight. Or if you are given a range of molecular weights, just take the middle molecular weight for each weight range and use that. After summing all those terms, you can see that the number average molecular weight for this polymer sample is 285, 574.72 grams per mole. This means that when we consider all of our polymers in our sample, the polymer size that statistically appears most frequently is that value. Let's move on to the weight average molecular weight now. The formula for the weight average molecular weight is very similar to the number average molecular weight, except for using the number fraction of our polymers we're going to be using the weight fraction for our polymer sample. This will tell us the total molecular weight in our polymer sample for that one particular polymer size. Then we find the weight fraction, we divide the total weight for that polymer size by the total molecular weight of our whole sample. Let's repeat this for the remaining molecular weight sizes. Now, we are ready to solve for the weight average molecular weight. Just like we did for the number average molecular weight, let's sum each of these found weight fractions by their corresponding molecular weight. Therefore, our weight average polymer molecular weight is 323, 612.4 grams per mole. Just notice the relatively large difference between our two measured molecular weights. Why do you think this is? Well, in this case, it occurs because we have many small polymers appearing more frequently in our sample, but the large heavier polymers make up a lot more of the weight, which causes our weight average molecular weight to be skewed in the heavier direction. Hi everyone, in this video, I wanna talk about what the relationship between various polymer properties and the molecular weight of polymers are. So just quickly remember that the molecular weight of polymers are generally described as averages, such as the number average molecular weight 
and the weight average, molecular weight. The reason we use averages with polymers is because all polymer molecules in a sample are not going to be all the exact same size. If you want to learn more about this, I will post a video in the description below to help your understanding on how we can understand the molecular weight of a polymer sample. All right, so let's get to the core of this video. Let's talk about the effects a polymer's molecular weight has on its properties. Let's imagine we have two polymer samples of the same polymer. However, one has a very high average polymer chain length and therefore a higher molecular weight, and the other has a lower average polymer chain length and therefore a lower molecular weight. In our first sample, do you think the polymers are going to be more or less mobile when subjected to some force? Well, with the larger length polymers, they have less mobility when subjected to a force. So, this polymer sample is going to be much tougher than the lower molecular weight sample. So, some physical properties that will increase as the molecular weight of our polymer sample increases are the impact strength, which is how much energy our polymer can withstand when a given force is instantly applied to it, the tensile strength, how well the polymer resists being pulled apart, its melting temperature, which makes sense as in liquids, the molecules are flowing around one another, and as we minimize the amount of space around our polymers, the more energy they will need to overcome that barrier. The toughness of our polymer will also increase, which is a polymer's resistance to fracture and deformation. Another great property that is added by larger molecular weights is the creep resistance, which is a type of deformation that can occur over time when subjected to a consistent force. Although many of the aforementioned properties are great for many applications, there are some disadvantages to larger molecular weight polymer samples. As the molecular weight of our polymer samples increase, the difficulty in processing them increases as they are much less mobile and harder to manipulate. The reasoning for this is the viscosity of the polymer increases with chain length. Therefore, we can more easily process lower molecular weight polymers. So, in conclusion, there is no general rule for if it's better to have a polymer with a longer average chain length or shorter ones. The biggest influence over the ideal chain size is the application of your polymer sample. So let's say you're testing a polymer's ability to absorb an impact, and your polymer keeps breaking below the acceptable threshold. Well, to fix this problem, you may consider increasing the average polymer molecular weight so that its impact strength is increased. You could also consider other polymer additives to increase the strength. However, this is a topic for another video. Thank you for checking out this video, and I hope it helped your understanding of how the properties of a polymer are altered depending on the molecular weight of that polymer sample. Hey everyone, in this video I want to talk about what the configuration of polymers is and the importance of it in the structure of polymers. In the previous video, which I'll post a link in the description below if you're interested, we talked about the various polymer chain lengths and how to classify them. To further build on this topic of understanding and defining our polymer chain lengths, we will talk about the configuration of a polymer chain and the conformation of a polymer chain, which will be the next video in this playlist. So. Let's start with the definition of a polymer's configuration. The configuration of a polymer refers to the chemically set configuration of the polymer's bonds, which can only be changed by breaking the relevant bonds. At a basic level, we are saying this. We have this order of atoms, but this is not enough to fully describe our polymer. Let's look at this blue square here. The atom configuration is still the same in polymer one and two, but the polymers are very different from one another. So, we can have the same atom configuration, but different polymers. Therefore, we are interested in what are called isomers. These are polymers, or just compounds in general, that have the same atom arrangement, but different spatial arrangements. The reason for this is that around a single bond, the atom on the right here can freely rotate. However, when we add a second bond, it is no longer able to rotate, and the configuration is locked in, which is very important in polymer properties. Let's begin by talking about stereoisomers. So, let's say that I asked you to draw me this simple polymer. Well, you think, that's simple enough, so you draw the following polymer. But wait, what if our carbon on the right here was attached the other way around? Well, we get the same chemical formula for both, so which is right? Well, they're both right, and these are called isomers, which we mentioned earlier, as they share the same chemical formula, but are very different from one another. Because they are so different, this is why we needed proper names for them, which are cis and trans. 
So, in these two polymers, we have the exact same configuration of our atoms, so the order of our atoms. The only thing that is different is that we could have this larger methyl group on either end of the right carbon, and this will greatly affect the properties of the polymer, thus the reason for needing to define cis and trans versions. I will add another resource for naming cis and trans polymers in the description below if you haven't learned about them previously. All right. So that covers configuration differences about double bonds for polymers. But do you think we could run into configuration problems without double bonds? Well, of course we could. In some larger polymers, for example. So when the configuration of a polymer is important about single bonds, it is called tacticity. The tacticity of a polymer chain refers to the stereoregularity of the polymer chain. The stereoregularity of a polymer's chain just tells us the degree to which the polymer configuration follows some order. To better understand this, let's examine a planar linear polymer chain in which there are three tacticities. Firstly, there is an isotactic configuration where all the branching carbon groups, denoted R, lie on a single side of the main chain. Another example is atactic in which there is a random sequence of branching chains in no particular order. And lastly, there is syndiotactic, in which the branching carbon groups are always on alternating planes. Although single atoms about a single bond can rotate, tacticity is something to remember, and keep in mind that there is no way to rotate one of these three examples to create the other one. However, the configuration of them is all the same. The attachments of all the atoms is the same, just the sides and way they are set up is different. Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about what polymer conformation is. In the previous video, we talked about polymer configurations, which are the various polymer arrangements that we can have in polymers that are chemically bonded to one another. However, we also must consider the conformation of the polymers, which is the variations in the shape, size, and physical positioning of our polymers and its constituent monomers as a whole. This occurs by rotation around a single bond, and the amount of conformations that a given polymer can have is limited, or it can be an infinite amount, depending on a few factors. One such factor is what is called steric factors. An example of a steric factor is the following. If each carbon in this linear chain has a methyl group and a hydrogen attached to it, then the conformation will most likely be limited to the following, as the large methyl groups on either side of our central carbon will force it to the other side, as that is the lowest energy state requirement, which intuitively means that it is easier to maintain that position and therefore is favorable to our polymer. Other factors affecting the conformation of polymer chains is the temperature of the polymer. Polymers have various states that they can exist in, given the temperature that they are at. At higher temperatures, the monomers are often able to be more mobile as they have higher energy states. Roughly broken down, we have completely free rotation, wherein the single bonds can travel completely around the cone of revolution, which is a cone created by rotating a third carbon atom 109.5 degrees about the adjoined carbon atom. 109.5 degrees is used as it is the bond angle that spreads the hydrogen atoms of the various carbon atoms out the most. Completely free rotation is when the polymer is a melt, and the various polymers are very free to move around. Next, if we decrease the temperature of our polymer, we can achieve a state at which there is not enough energy for the polymers to rotate due to the limited energy available. This is typically called a glassy state of the polymer. Here the polymer will be much more rigid as it cannot freely move about. Lastly, we need to mention what happens when our polymer is either crystalline or amorphous. In a crystalline state, each polymer fits together into what is called a lattice, which is a way of saying that all of our polymers fit together very nicely and we have no rotation of our carbon atoms, as the intermolecular bonds stabilize the structure. In an amorphous polymer, which means that there is no defined structure within the polymer, we will have much more mobility than a crystalline structure, as there is no defined structure for each polymer to sit into. And with both of these polymer structures, as temperature increases, mobility will increase for both. However, it will increase for amorphous polymers much more quickly than crystalline polymers. Thank you for checking out this video, and I hope it helped your understanding of what polymer conformation is, 
and how it is altered by internal and external factors, like the polymer structure and the temperature supplied respectively. Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the various types of bonds that are found in polymers. The types of bonds that hold polymers together provide lots of knowledge into how the polymer will react under different characterization methods, such as how the polymer will react to being heated up, its elasticity, and many other things. In general, we can differentiate the types of bonds that hold polymers together as primary or secondary bonds. Let's first focus on the stronger of the two, and that is primary bonds. Primary bonds are covalent bonds. These are likely to be the strongest types of bonds that you will encounter in polymer engineering. Although, in general, ionic bonds are stronger than covalent bonds, these types of bonds are very uncommon in polymer engineering. So, you've probably heard of this type of bond before in any intro to chemistry class. These are the bonds that occur when two neighboring atoms share a set of electrons, causing a chemical connection between the two atoms. In polymer engineering, these types of bonds can act as links or connectors between our various monomers and polymers. The benefits to covalent bonds are that they are very strong, which gives the polymer excellent chemical and thermal stability, which, depending on your desired application, is usually very desirable. Chemical stability means that our polymer is less reactive and will often remain inert. Thermal stability means that if our polymer is heated, the bonds that connect our monomers will remain attached longer. These types of bonds can be found in both thermoplastics and thermosets. However, if the covalent bonds connect the polymers to one another, we will get a thermoset because when the heat is applied, this cross-linking of the polymers will prevent the polymers from moving around and reorienting themselves, which is the reason that thermoplastics are able to be reshaped when heated. So, now that we have covered primary bonds, what are the secondary bonds in polymer engineering? Well, there are two secondary bonds of interest in polymer engineering. Firstly, let's talk about van der Waals forces and then go into hydrogen bonding. Van der Waals forces are weak forces that are caused by slight differences in the electrical charge of individual molecules and atoms at a given time. These types of forces are often described as London dispersion forces or dipole-dipole forces, which we will talk about shortly in the hydrogen bonding section. So, because of this, let's focus on London dispersion forces, which are temporary forces between molecules that arise from slight, non-permanent differences in the electrical charge. The way I like to think of this is imagining the electrons around an atom being random, and this randomness can cause local, short-distance attractions between molecules. The weak force keeping the two regions together is called a van der Waals force. These bonds are common in thermoplastic materials, as when energy is applied to the polymer through heating it, these weak forces can easily be broken and then the polymer can slide around and reorient themselves more easily. Whereas in thermal sets, they are not present or very weak and therefore not dominant. Lastly, let's talk about hydrogen bonding in polymers. Hydrogen bonds are quite a bit stronger than van der Waals forces. However, they are still relatively weak when compared to covalent bonds. Just as a brief example, let's look at these two water molecules. The hydrogen region will be slightly positive as the attached oxygen atom will hog the shared electrons. This is because it has a higher electronegativity. The same thing will occur on the right water molecule and therefore the oxygen atom will retain a slight negative charge. Therefore, we have a region of slight positive charge and a region of slight negative charge. And intuitively, we know that these two regions will want to be together, so they do. As we previously talked about, hydrogen bonds also begin with a dipole being created from the different electronegativities of the bonded atoms which we just showed previously. Therefore, these differences in electronegativities lead to much more permanent dipoles than that experienced in the previously talked about van der Waals forces. So, hydrogen bonded to oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen are common examples where a dipole is created. So hydrogen bonding is caused by this dipole-dipole interaction. In summary, we covered van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, and covalent bonding. To reiterate, covalent bonding 
is the strongest type of bond we will likely experience in polymer engineering. Then we have hydrogen bonding, and then van der Waals forces are the weakest of the three. Spending time understanding your polymer and how its monomers attach to one another and how the various polymers interact with one another can greatly aid your understanding of a polymer sample's properties as a whole. Thank you for checking out this video and I hope it helped your understanding of the various types of bonds that are prevalent in polymer engineering. Hey everyone, in this video I want to talk about thermoplastics and thermosets. We'll talk about the major differences between the two and some examples to ensure you understand. Let's start by talking about thermoplastics. Thermoplastics are really cool in that at higher temperatures we can reshape them into anything we want. And then we let them cool and they will become stronger and harden to the shape that we set for them. And that is basically how recycling works. You send your thermoplastic material to recycling facilities, they are sorted and the plastic material are grouped, melted down, and shaped into something useful for society. And this ability to be heated, reshaped, and cooled is the key difference between thermoplastics and thermosets. In a thermoset, it is not possible to shape the polymer no matter what temperature is used. The polymer will just get charred and turned into a blackened, burnt mess that is completely useless in a thermoset. Well then, you may ask, why do we need thermosets if thermoplastics are so great? Well, thermosets have their own special property. Thermosets are better at withstanding their shape and strength when heated, so they won't soften when heated, they will just become harder and more brittle, whereas a thermoplastic will soften and weaken when heated. So, in summary, when creating a thermoset, you essentially have one opportunity to get the shape that you want, and after that, it is stuck in the shape of the mold that you used. Well, why is this the case though? Why do thermosets burn and char and thermoplastics can just be fine? Well, this is because thermosets have 3D cross-linking, which we'll talk about more in a future video, of their polymers, but it is essentially meaning that the individual polymer molecules are trapped in place, kind of like a Rubik's Cube, and they cannot move at all, whereas in thermoplastics they are not. In a thermoplastic material, the polymers are typically linear chains, kind of like noodles, and they can just slip and slide around one another as needed. Let's just quickly go through a couple examples of common thermoplastics and thermosets so that you can better identify them. Some common thermoplastics are polyethylene, which could be low density, then these are like the plastic bags you might see in the superstore, or high density, which you could find in your bathroom as containers for shampoo or conditioner or many other things. Another is polypropylene, which can be used for many bottle caps and tote bags that are currently being used in many developed countries to eliminate the need for plastic bags. Another common thermoplastic is ABS, which makes up many Lego pieces. There are tons more, and their ability to be recycled makes them super interesting. Now let's go through some examples of common thermosets. Epoxy resin is a thermoset, and is commonly used in a lot of adhesive purposes. Vulcanized rubber is another thermoset, and these can be used like hockey pucks in tires. And polyurethane polymers are also thermosets, and these include mattresses, foam sponges, spandex, and many more. Again, much like thermoplastics, there are a ton of thermosets which I have not talked about here. This is just to give you an idea of some of the common thermoplastics and thermosets that you may have in your vicinity. Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the general properties and characteristics of thermoplastic polymers. In a previous video we briefly went through the key differences between a thermoplastic polymer and a thermoset polymer. However, now that we know a bit more about polymers, we can get a bit more in depth about thermoplastic polymers. So. Let's remember broadly what a thermoplastic polymer is. A thermoplastic polymer's most defining characteristic is that it can be heated and reshaped any way that we want. So, if we had this square solid thermoplastic material here, all we would need to do is bring its temperature up to its melting temperature, at which point there is enough energy present to break all the minor bonds holding the polymers in place. These are typically hydrogen bonds and van der Waals forces. This allows the polymers to slide around each other and reorient themselves, which is why we can physically reshape them. Once we have the thermoplastic in the shape that we want, we remove the energy source, that is the heat, and let them cool down. Once the energy of the system is too low to break the minor bonds, then the polymers become a solid again, in the new shape. Like this weird S shape for example. So, from this, we can infer that thermoplastics do not have any cross-linking that is significant, 
as this would prevent the polymers from sliding around one another as they would be locked into a 3D lattice. For more details about this cross-linking, check out our thermo set properties video in the description below. So let's talk about the properties and stability of thermoplastics as a generality. Just note that no matter which category a polymer may fall under, thermoplastic versus a thermo set, the properties within a single category can be widely different even though they appear to be very similar polymers. And this is what makes polymers really amazing. There are so many potential use cases and so much that we can do with polymers that makes them such an interesting field of study. Thermoplastics are generally easy to color compared to thermosets, such as colored LDPE bags you may get from the grocery store. Thermoplastics are also great for creating items that are transparent. Thermoset polymers are very limited in terms of the polymers that are actually see-through, whereas there are many thermoplastics that can be used for this. In terms of toughness, thermoplastics are generally much better than thermosets. This means that they can absorb more energy and deform more plastically without breaking. This causes thermoplastics to have a lower tensile strength but a higher elongation to break than thermoset polymers. In terms of cost, thermoplastics are generally much cheaper than thermosets to produce. This is caused by numerous reasons, such as they are easier to process, recycle, and they are often less specified than many thermosets, which often are created for one specific application only. Although many thermoplastics have great chemical resistance, thermosets are significantly better at this. In general, thermoplastics are synthesized using addition polymerization, which we will talk about in depth in a future video. Building on this, industrially, thermoplastics are often produced via blow molding, casting, thermofolding, rotational molding, injection molding, and several other methods. Eventually, I hope to cover all of these production methods more in depth, so look out for those videos in the future. Thermoplastics also generally have a lower molecular weight than thermosets, which should make sense, right? If we had a massive macromolecule for our thermoplastic polymer, we would have a hard time moving that around versus a small snake-like polymer, like linear low-density polyethylene. Thank you for checking out this video, and I hope it helped your general understanding of some of the thermoplastic polymer properties and some of the ways that we can produce them. Hey everyone, in this video, we're going to be talking about general properties and characteristics of thermoset polymers. In a previous video, we briefly went through the key differences between a thermoplastic polymer and a thermoset polymer. However, now that we know a bit more about polymers, we can get a little bit more into depth about what a thermoset polymer is. So, let's remember broadly what a thermoset polymer is. A thermoset polymer's most defining characteristic is that it cannot be heated and reshaped like a thermoplastic polymer. It will simply char and turn into a burnt mess. But why is this the case? Why can we so easily heat and reshape thermoplastics, but not thermosets? Well, thermoset polymers have what is called cross-linking. This occurs where the individual polymers connect to one another with strong bonds, and they cannot readily be broken by simply applying heat, like the weak bonds between thermoplastic polymers can. So, it basically means that the thermosets polymers are locked in place and can just burn. However, there must be some advantages to this type of polymer, right? Well, of course there is. There are tons of applications. However, they are generally a lot more specific than thermoplastic polymers. By that I mean many thermosets are designed for a single purpose, and that is all it is used for. Whereas things like LDPE, a thermoplastic, can be used for plastic bags, manufacturing containers, and much more. So, let's talk more about the properties and stability of thermosets. Just note that no matter which category a polymer may fall under, thermoplastic versus thermoset, the properties within a single one of these categories can be wildly different for even what appears to be very similar polymers. This is really what makes polymers amazing. There are so many potential use cases and so much that we can do with polymers that makes them such an interesting field of study. Thermosets are generally much harder to color than thermoplastics, and this is due to the nature of their cross-linking. Additionally, it is much easier to get a thermoplastic to be transparent than a thermoset, as there are very limited options for thermosets that are see-through. This is because of the 3D lattice that occurs when setting the thermoset polymer. 
However, this cross-linking does make the thermoset polymer very brittle, meaning it usually becomes very, very hard and can withstand a lot of force before breaking. But when it does break, it will not bend. So when enough force is applied, its maximum tensile strength, it will just snap and not stretch like a thermoplastic would. In terms of cost, thermosets are typically quite a bit more expensive than thermoplastics. And this is due to several reasons. Number one, as I previously stated, thermosets are usually extremely use case specific. This can cause the R&D and refinement on the production of the thermoset to be much higher than that of a thermoplastic. Additionally, unlike thermoplastics, thermosets cannot be remelted and recycled, and therefore they can be harder to process. In general, thermosets have great chemical resistance, for the same reason as the coloring resistance. And this chemical resistance is much better than thermoplastics. Thermosets are usually created by adding all the polymers, plasticizers, and additives together, and then brought to a high temperature in a mold that we will need them in. Then we set the polymer by letting it cool. It is during this cooling stage, or setting, that the cross-linking between the polymer occur. We will go more into depth about this process in a future video though. Thermosets molecular mass generally becomes massive as the cross-linking between the polymers connects them all together. This causes the molecular weight of thermosets to be much, much larger than many thermoplastics. So if we had a massive macromolecule that is our thermoset polymer, they would have a hard time moving around as it is so large and interconnected into the 3D cross-linking lattice we previously talked about, versus a small snake-like polymer like linear low-density polyethylene, which is a thermoplastic. And it can just move around other polymers, which makes it much easier to reshape, and that is why it's a thermoplastic and not a thermoset. Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about another method that we can use to evaluate a polydispersed sample. So this method is called either size exclusion chromatography, SEC, or gel permeability chromatography, GPC. These are the exact same thing, just a different name. Let's first break this name down and go through more in depth what it all means. So chromatography is when we take a mixture and separate its various components by moving them based on some characteristic. This movement will occur at different rates and we can separate our mixture into its various components. Well, in size exclusion chromatography, we are separating the different size polymers, well, as the name implies, by their size. So how does this all work? Well, let's imagine that we have this really long column here. Well, at the top of our column, let's say that we have our polymer in a solvent. So our polymers are just floating around in our solvent. And if we were to examine the sample closer, we would have some polymers that are really short and some that are really long, as our sample is polydispersed meaning that it has chains of different sizes. Now, let's talk about how this technique actually works. Well, to do this, we need to understand what is going on in our long column here. This column is packed with a material that is small and extremely porous. The idea here is that our small polymers will get trapped and spend a much longer time navigating their way through the column as their path is extremely long compared to that of a larger polymer which cannot enter the highly porous packing material. This diagram that I drew here should make it clear to you why smaller polymers have a much longer travel path than larger polymers. It is also important to acknowledge that we do not want a packing material that will adsorb our smaller polymers. If there was a chemical interaction between the smaller polymers and the surface of our packaging material, the smaller polymers would just get stuck and never actually make their way through the column, which would not be ideal. So our packed column here is separating our polymers strictly by their size, hence the name size exclusion chromatography. So let's say that we have a packed column like this. We are trying to evaluate the polydispersity of our newest polymer product. We know that there are going to be three main components of our product, a small polymer, a medium sized polymer, and a large polymer. Well, we would take our polymer sample and add it to some solvent, and this allows it to flow through our column more easily. Then, over time, we would notice that the larger polymers approach our measurement device first. Our measurement device could be a spectrophotometer, for example, and we would get an intensity peak, say something like this. Then eventually, over time, our medium polymer approaches the reader, and we would get a second peak. And the same would eventually happen for our smallest polymer. 
These three distinct intensity peaks can help us analyze the composition of our polymer sample, which is great not only for research and development of understanding our product, but also ensuring the quality control of our product is good. So in summary, and in reality, we would receive a breakthrough curve for each of these components that will help us more understand our sample's composition. So let's think of some more ways in which SEC can be used. Well, if you had a sample of an unknown composition, you could use this method to evaluate roughly how many components make up your sample. Additionally, this technique can be used to separate small impurities from larger polymers. We would run our large polymers with the small impurities through the column, and over time, the impurities would get stuck and left behind as our larger polymers worked their way out of the column, and this would leave us with a purified product in the end. Additionally, I just want to mention that it is common to see a heater around our column, as this helps decrease the viscosity of our polymer solvent and helps the solvent from becoming too sluggish within our column. Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the molecular weight of copolymers. We'll begin by doing a quick review of what a polymer's molecular weight means, what a copolymer is, and then go into a quick example of how we can calculate the molecular weight of a copolymer. So, if we remember back to some of our earliest chemistry classes, we are taught about the molecular weight of various atoms, which, if you remember, is typically given on the periodic table as grams per mole, which just means when you have an Avogadro's number of atoms, we have a certain weight of those atoms or compounds. So, we can write that the definition for the molecular weight of a given species is the sum of the atomic weights of all the atoms within the polymer per mole. Now, Let's remember back to an earlier video where copolymers were introduced. A copolymer is a polymer that is constructed of more than one monomer, meaning that our polymer structure is made up of two or more different monomers. I will leave a link in the description below for a further clarification on what exactly a copolymer is and the different types of copolymers. So now that we have reviewed what a polymer's molecular weight is and what a copolymer is, let's now go over how we find the molecular weight of a copolymer. Well, we can say that MC, the molecular weight of a copolymer's average repeating unit, is equal to the sum of each monomer's mole fraction, which we can call Fi, times the molecular weight of the monomer. As I just stated, this gives us the average molecular weight for a given subunit in this copolymer. Then, if we remember back to the degree of polymerization, we have the following formula. This states that the degree of polymerization is equal to the number average molecular weight divided by the molecular weight of the repeating monomer. When also applying this formula to copolymers, we replace M with MC like so. So now that we've gone over the concepts and developed some relevant formulas, let's go through a quick example. Our problem states to calculate the number average molecular weight of ethylene polyvinyl acetate. Well, what is ethylene polyvinyl acetate? This copolymer is commonly used in spongy foam-like materials, such as flip-flops and the little foam blocks that kids play with, and things like that. In this example, we are told that the ethylene molar fraction in this copolymer is 0.65. Therefore, vinyl acetate, polyvinyl acetate that is, makes up 35% of this polymer's molecular composition. We are also told that the degree of polymerization for this copolymer is 2750. Firstly, we must find the molecular weights of both ethylene and polyvinyl acetate. You can find these simply by summing up the individual atomic weights of each of these monomers, or just entering the monomer name into a search engine. So, we find that ethylene has a molecular weight of 28.05 grams per mole, and polyvinyl acetate has a molecular weight of 86.09 grams per mole. We then apply these formulas for the copolymer's average repeating unit. In terms of moles, ethylene is 65% of our copolymer, and polyvinyl acetate is 35% of our copolymer. Therefore, the copolymer's average repeating unit's molecular weight is 48.37 grams per mole. Then, since we know that the degree of polymerization for this copolymer, we can now easily find the number average molecular weight. And we determine this to be 2,418.33 grams per mole. Hey everyone, let's talk about what elastomers are. Let's begin with a quick definition of elastomers, and then we'll go into a bit more depth about what makes elastomers special. 
Elastomers are a particularly special and very useful type of polymer. As they have one amazing characteristic that differentiates them from other polymers. That property is that they are very elastic. Elastomers are viscoelastic materials, which means that they exhibit both elastic and viscous behaviors, which means that we can stretch and pull them lots and they will not plastically deform, up to a certain point. Plastic deformation is permanent changes in the polymer structure, meaning that plastic deformation is a permanent change in the polymer structure, and the polymer will not return to its original shape, and plastic deformation will occur after a certain amount of force is applied to it, called the material's yield point but this will differ based on the type of elastomer you are dealing with. We should talk about what gives the elastomers this very flexible and elastic property. If you remember back to one of our previous videos on thermoplastic and thermoset polymers, link in the description below, you will remember that we talked about the cross-linking of polymers. Cross-linking is when separate polymer chains have a linked covalent bond. The more cross-linking in a given polymer sample, the more the mobility of the polymer sample is limited. So thermoset polymers have cross-linking and thermoplastic polymers do not to any significant degree. Elastomers are often thermoset polymers with a minimal amount of cross-linking, which allows the polymers to stretch but retain their structure. I should note that there are a few examples of thermoplastic elastomers, but these are fairly limited and as a whole, elastomers are largely thermosets. In terms of general characteristics of elastomers, they typically have high elongation to break, which means that we can stretch them a lot before they'll break. I will leave a link in the description below for a great summary of advantages and disadvantages of many common elastomers. Now that we have an understanding of what elastomers are, let's talk about a few elastomer examples that you may recognize. Many gaskets, which are used for seals to prevent water leakage at a connecting point, say with two different pipes, are elastomers. All rubbers are a type of elastomer. Neoprene, commonly used for wetsuits that surfers wear, are also a type of elastomer. Many silicon-based polymers are also elastomers, such as Livestrong bracelets or any other silicon rubber bracelet. Another example are nitrile rubber gloves that are commonly used as personal protective equipment in laboratories. Hey everyone, let's talk about the two fundamental types of polymer arrangements. These two fundamental arrangements are called crystalline and amorphous. So, in this video, we'll talk about what these two arrangements are. Then, in the next video, we'll spend some time and talk about the general trends in properties that each of these polymer morphologies exhibit. These arrangements are formed as a heated polymer is cooled. So, imagine that we have our ball of molten polymer. Since the temperature is high here, there's clearly a lot of energy present in the system. This allows the polymers to move freely past and around its neighboring polymers. However, what happens when we turn the heat to our system off? Well, over time, the energy will be distributed convectively to the air surrounding our pot, and the polymers will have less and less energy to move around and past one another. Therefore, at some point, the polymer will begin to become either crystalline or amorphous. However, in both arrangements, these polymers are not actively mobile and the polymer mass has went from a liquid to a solid. Let's begin with the crystalline arrangement. Crystalline regions in a polymer are densely folded and neatly packaged crystals. They are called crystalline, which stems from the area of study, crystallography. Other than polymers, there are many other solids that can present crystalline molecular arrangements, such as diamonds, salts, and even ice. All these solids have reoccurring lattices which is basically just an ideal arrangement of the atoms in the solid. Through such, you can think of this like the polymers fitting better together. So, to keep it simple, let's look at polypropylene, sometimes referred to as PP, which you may know as pop bottle caps, among other things. This rather simple polymer exhibits high crystallinity due to its alternating methyl groups when forming a polymer chain. However, as there are different forms of the same polymers, the amount of crystallinity of a polymer depends on numerous factors. Firstly, depending on how quickly the polymer is cooled from the liquid state will largely impact the crystallinity of the solid. If we quickly cooled polymers, for example, they do not have time to rearrange themselves into an energy ideal configuration. They're essentially just becoming locked in space. Whereas if we cooled the polymer much, much slower, then the polymer chains could still move and slide around each other and reorienting themselves to a lower energy state. 
I should also note that you may see polymers that exhibit relatively large amounts of crystallinity, as semi-crystalline polymers, as this is the proper name. This is because no polymer is really 100% crystalline. They're all on a spectrum of 0 to, say, 80 or 90. So, that should give you a good introduction to crystalline polymers. But what about amorphous polymers? Well, if a crystalline region is an area in a polymer where the polymers are neatly folded, an amorphous polymer must be an area where this isn't the case. An amorphous polymer is just a region in the polymer where there's no structured layout to the polymers. They're just random. Amorphous means without a shape, which is fitting and an easy way to remember what it is. In the earlier example, when we were discussing the cooling of a polymer, quickly cooling the polymer decreases the amount of crystalline regions in the polymer, and therefore this is increasing the amount of amorphous regions that are present. So, what causes some polymers to become more crystalline than others? Well, we already talked about one earlier. That is how quickly we can cool the polymer from a liquid state to a solid. But, what other factors will affect our percentage of crystallinity? Well, there are actually several factors that largely impact our crystallinity, so let's talk about those now. Firstly, we have the polarity of the polymer. Polar molecules are attracted to one another, and therefore it makes sense that this will lead to a higher level of crystallinity, as the molecules from the same or another polymer chain can better bind and compress themselves into a crystalline formation. Secondly, the flexibility of our polymers is also very important. This can be observed best in low-density polyethylene versus high-density polyethylene. LDPE, low-density polyethylene, is a straight and therefore very flexible polymer. That is why plastic bags are so flexible. Whereas things like HDPE, high-density polyethylene, such as detergent bottles, are very hard and rigid. In the HDPE, the polymers are not at all flexible and are more fixed in a given position, unable to move thus more crystalline. Thirdly, a large side chain on a polymer can generally limit the polymer's ability to be mobile, and one would think that this would lead to a more crystalline polymer, however this is a trade-off with the reduction in the attraction forces between the main polymer chains. Fourth, the regularity of the structure is also important. So, if we have a syndiotactic or an isotactic polymer, we are able to package our polymers closer together whereas an atactic polymer cannot rearrange itself into an ideal configuration to achieve crystallinity. I will leave a link in the description about these terms in case you missed that video. As you can imagine, this balance between these many factors can get quite complex in large polymers. As I stated earlier in the coming videos, we will talk about the pros and cons of having higher quantities of either crystalline or amorphous regions in your polymer. Hey everyone. Let's talk about the general properties of crystalline and amorphous polymers. So, we'll talk about the common characteristics that crystalline and amorphous polymers exhibit due to their polymer morphology. So, as we discussed in the last video, crystalline polymers are much more densely packaged than amorphous polymers. This causes them to be more rigid and strong, which should make sense as amorphous polymers are just spread out, random and noodle-like, which makes them good for flexibility but not for strength. So, in terms of strength, crystalline polymers are generally much higher in just about all measures of strength, such as its tensile strength. This should make sense, as in crystalline polymers, the polymers are held really tightly together, and they are much more resistant to movement compared to amorphous polymers. Now, obviously, this is going to vary from polymer to polymer, in terms of how much difference there is in something like the tensile strength. But, for example, HDPE, high-density polyethylene, has about 2.5 to 3 times the tensile strength of LDPE, low density polyethylene. HDPE has a high crystallinity of about 80 to 90%, whereas LDPE is considered to have a low crystallinity at about 40%. In terms of density, crystalline polymers are higher, which should make sense as the polymers themselves can compress themselves better and are more tightly packaged than amorphous polymers. In terms of degrading the polymer, such as chemical resistance, warping the polymer, creep resistance, crystalline polymers is again better than amorphous polymers, as their tight intermolecular bonding makes potential chemical groups looking to bind unable to do so. Whereas amorphous polymers are not tightly chemically bound, and therefore more likely to react with a given chemical group near it. 
Okay, so if crystalline polymers are so awesome, why do we need amorphous polymers, you may ask? Well, there are many things that amorphous polymers can do that crystalline polymers just can't. For example, if you want to increase the gas transfer through your polymer for some reason, well, then you're going to want a more amorphous polymer, as gas is often unable to permeate the tight intermolecular forces of crystalline polymers, whereas the noodle-like shape of amorphous polymers can allow gas molecules to pass through. Alternatively, if you want to prevent gas from transmitting through your polymer, you want a more crystalline polymer. One amazing property of amorphous polymers is their ability to be stretched and elongated. For example, if you take a plastic bag or saran wrap and pull on it, you will find that it can be stretched really, really long before breaking. This is because amorphous polymers are very flexible and not tightly intermolecularly bound like the crystalline polymers. Therefore, the bonds in the polymer can be stretched and not broken. This is why amorphous polymers are used for applications where flexibility is necessary, as crystalline polymers are usually hard and rigid and completely inflexible. Hey everyone, over the past few videos we have been talking about what crystalline and amorphous polymers are, and the general trends that we see in their properties. However, we have yet to talk about how to determine the percentage crystallinity of a polymer sample. So, let's just remember one key difference between crystalline and amorphous polymers. Crystalline polymers are able to compress and really compact themselves whereas amorphous polymers are not structured and are very noodle-like. Therefore, crystalline regions in a polymer will have a higher density than the amorphous regions. Remember that all polymer samples will have some amorphous and crystalline regions. So, if we were to view an ideal spectrum here, we would have 100% amorphous polymers with the lowest possible density for the polymer. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have the highest possible density that our polymer can achieve with 100% crystallinity. Now, in reality, our polymer sample will always be somewhere in this range, depending on many factors discussed in the previous video. But how do we determine exactly where our polymer sample will land on the spectrum? Well, a formula we can use to determine the percentage crystallinity of a polymer sample is presented here. We have the density of a hypothetically pure crystalline polymer times the difference in our polymer sample in our polymer sample's real density minus the hypothetical 100% amorphous density, which is all divided by the density of our sample times the difference in our two hypothetical densities. Now, Obviously, we can only use this equation if we have sufficient information about our polymer's density. So, what do we do if we don't have all this information and cannot find it online? Well, then we need to use DSC or some other laboratory quantification method. DSC is very common as it is quick and easy if you have the proper equipment available to you. DSC stands for Differential Scanning Calorimetry. DSC works by placing our polymer sample in the machine and it measures the amount of heat it takes to melt our polymer using known values. The higher the crystallinity of the polymer sample, the more heat that needs to be applied to break the tighter intermolecular bonds of the crystalline regions. So we apply heat at a constant rate and get a graph that looks something like this. This blue area is all the heat that is being applied. And in this area where we see an increase in the heat applied, this is because we need more energy to break the crystalline regions up. So, we take the amount of energy needed to melt, say, 1 gram of our polymer sample, first 1 gram of a hypothetical 100% crystalline version of our polymer, then we multiply that by 100% and we get our sample's crystallinity. Hi everyone, in this video I want to talk about how we can use the mark Huink equation to determine the molecular weight of polymers through measuring their intrinsic viscosity. Just note, that this method will only work if a previous study has been performed in determining the molecular weight for your solute using the specific solute, solvent, and temperature combination that you are going to use. The reason for this is that we need two constants in this intrinsic viscosity method that can only be found using the intrinsic viscosity and the molecular weight of the solution plot. However, once the aforementioned constants are found, then the molecular weight for your samples, or anyone else's samples, can be found much easier as long as the two constants are known. Moving forward, let's first go through a quick review of the intrinsic viscosity and then go into the Marcuink equation. 
So what is a polymer's intrinsic viscosity? Firstly, we represent the intrinsic viscosity in polymer science as an eta symbol with square brackets. This is not to be confused with your typical viscosity though, which is represented by an eta with no square brackets. These are not the same thing. So what is the intrinsic viscosity? The intrinsic viscosity is a measure of a given solute's effect on a certain solution's viscosity. So we are trying to find a polymer's molecular weight by seeing how it changes the viscosity of a known solvent. Mathematically, the intrinsic viscosity is represented using the following equation. So we have the limit as the concentration goes to zero of a specific viscosity over the concentration. In terms of concentration, think of the solute in the solvent solution as becoming infinitely dilute. However, it is not really possible to add an infinitesimally small amount of solute to our solvent. So what do we do? Well, we need to find another way of determining this. We find this through plotting the reduced viscosity by varying concentrations of our solute in our solvent. And the intrinsic viscosity will be the y-intercept of this. The reduced viscosity is simply the specific viscosity over the concentration. The specific viscosity is the solution's viscosity minus the solvent's viscosity over the solvent's viscosity, which can also be written more simply like this. So let's say that we are trying to determine the molecular weight of a certain polymer that we are studying. How do we go about understanding its properties? Well, we will go to our lab equipment and find a U-Bohold viscometer. There are tons of great videos about this viscometer on the internet, however the gist is this. We place a solvent of known properties into the base of the viscometer, then add a known amount of solvent. And then we create a vacuum on one side of the viscometer. This pressure difference between the left and right side of the U-tube will force the liquid up the right side. From this, the time can be taken for how long it takes the fluid to climb the capillary, which is just another way of saying a very small hole. Therefore, through performing several of these tests using various concentrations of our solute, we will notice changes in the viscosity, depending on how much solute was added. Think of this like adding molasses to water. Molasses has a very high viscosity, meaning that it takes a lot of force to move it. The more molasses, our solute, we add to our solvent, the water, the more change we will observe in our time it takes for the solution to climb the capillary. After we are finished testing at different concentrations, we have determined our solutions and solvents reduced viscosities, and through these equations we discussed earlier, you can find the intrinsic viscosity of the solute. However, how do we still find the molecular weight? Well, we need to use an empirical, meaning from experiments, relationship. Through taking the logarithms of the intrinsic viscosities at the various concentrations and the logarithms of the molecular weights of each test makeup, plus our two constants, we can find our molecular weight. This is called the mark huink equation, and as you can see here, it is of the form of an equation of a line in slope-intercept form. The constants k and a are the ones I mentioned earlier. From this mark huink equation, we can easily determine the molecular weight of a polymer if our two constants are known and the intrinsic viscosity over various concentrations. The a value characterizes the solvent used as a general rule of thumb most of the time, A remains between 0.5 and 0.8, where a good solvent has a value closer to 0.8 and a bad solvent has one closer to 0.5. K is just a constant that depends on the temperature, solvent, and solute relationship. As I mentioned previously, if you're the first person studying the relationship given between a given solvent, solute, and temperature, then you need to use another method, such as light scattering, to first determine the molecular weights of the solution over varying concentrations. And from those molecular weights of the solution and intrinsic viscosity, you can determine the A and K values using that following relationship. The benefits to this method are that as long as K and A are known, it is quick and can aid you in understanding other polymer properties as well, such as the polymer's polymerization, melting temperature, branching, and many other important properties. Hey everyone, in the previous video, we were talking about how we can calculate the density of polymers. The reason that we need to talk about this is because the amount of crystallinity within a polymer sample will change the density of the polymer product. 
let's quickly recap why this is. Remember that a crystalline region of a polymer are areas where there is a dense repeating packaging of the various polymer chains. Whereas in the amorphous regions, we just have random packaging and it is not densely packed. Therefore, the more percent crystal in our polymer is, the higher density the material will be. As we also previously talked about, the degree of crystallinity and the amorphous regions in a given polymer sample will largely depend on several factors, such as processing conditions, additives to the polymer, the polymer makeup, and things like that. So, the equation that we introduced in the previous video for determining the percentage of crystallinity in a polymer sample can actually be used to help us find the density of a polymer if a few variables are known. The equation states that the percentage crystallinity is equal to 100% crystalline density times the difference between the sample's real density minus the 100% amorphous density, divided by the sample's real density times the difference between the 100% crystalline region density minus the 100% amorphous density. So, now that we have recapped all the information that we need, let's get into our first example. So, we are told that we are given a polymer sample which has a crystallinity of 52%. In its pure crystalline form, this polymer has a density of 2.42 kilograms per meter cubed, and in its pure amorphous form, it has a density of 2.25 kilograms per meter cubed. And we are told to find the true density of this sample. So, let's just write our equation here and determine which variables we need to find and which ones we are already given. So, let's highlight all of our variables that we have in green and the ones that we're missing in red. Therefore, we have all the variables that we need except for one, that being the true sample density. Therefore, since we only have one variable and one equation, we can now just begin rearranging the equation to solve for our unknown variable. So, let's just take a minute now and rearrange this equation for the polymer sample density. Okay. So after rearranging our equation, we have isolated it for our only unknown, and we can now plug in our known variables and solve for the sample's density. In this example, our sample has a density of 2.34 kilograms per meter cubed. Just a tip for these type of problems. If you get a density that is larger than your pure crystalline density, or a density lower than your pure amorphous density, then an error has likely occurred. All right, so let's go through another example now. Let's say that our professor gives us two samples of the same polymer type, extruded in slightly different ways. Polymer 1 has a density of 1.54 kilograms per meter cubed and is 40% crystalline. And polymer 2 has a density of 1.31 kilograms per meter cubed and is 28% crystalline. Now, let's try to find the 100% crystalline and amorphous densities. Take a second now and try solving this one on your own, and then you can compare your answers to the ones that I get. So, we have two equations and two unknowns. Therefore, our degrees of freedom is zero, meaning that we can fully solve this equation. So, let's begin with equation one and solve for one of our variables. It doesn't really matter which one you choose here, so I will just pick 100% crystalline density. Let's rearrange this equation to get all the crystalline density variables on the same side to isolate it, and create an equation to solve for it. There we go. We now have an equation that we can plug into equation two and solve for the amorphous density. As it is easier, I'm going to now move over to Microsoft Excel and show you how we can easily solve these types of questions. Let's add a cell for our crystalline and amorphous densities. Now, we can do something really cool. Let's click on the cell beside the amorphous density and go up to this little box here, and we can just simply rename this cell as PA. Then let's repeat this for PC beside the crystalline density. Through this, we can now add the equation we just found into our cell for the crystalline density. And everywhere we see the amorphous portion, we can just enter that as PA now, which makes our lives super easy. Then in another cell, we can just enter the right hand side of our second equation like so. Now, we need to use Excel's goal seek function. This will iteratively solve for our solution using a few parameters that we give to Excel. So, to use this, let's go to data, then what if analysis, and then goal seek. 
Just note that this may be slightly different on Windows, but I'm sure a quick Google search will tell you how to do this on Windows. So our set cell is a cell that we want to force to a certain value. So this is a cell where we just entered in our second equation, or the right hand side of our second equation. Then we want to set this to a value of 0.28. And we want to allow Excel to change the PA cell to allow us to get our 0.28 crystalline percentage. Then by running goal seek, we can see that our second equation here is iteratively solved and PA and subsequently PC are both solved. Thank you for checking out this video and I hope it helped your understanding of how we can calculate the density of polymers based on their crystallinity. If you enjoyed, please like, subscribe, and consider checking out our Patreon page to support the channel. However, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns about the information I provided in this video, please leave a comment down below and I will do my best to address your concerns.